welcome everybody it's today is international day of persons with disabilities and we have been we've got such a great day lined up today this morning we've had our learning disability group and we've been working on um, all uh, all things inclusive and um, we're going to show you a little bit about what we've done today but today um is also called um, World Disability Day. And the theme for this year's International Disability Day is building back better towards an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post-COVID-19 world um, for people with disabilities. So that's quite a major feat. Today, this year has been really quite challenging for many, many people. Um, it's had its challenges, but it's also been an amazing year for making connections and we at Disability Sheffield, particularly our learning disability group, Sheffield Voices, has um, been amazing in terms of making connections. We've managed to get loads more people coming to our online groups that we're running and um, we've connected with um, lots of people nationally and both internationally as well. So. Um, We've been looking very much at human rights of people with learning disabilities because we know this year that people um, with a learning disability have um, been more disadvantaged than what most of the population has. We know that people are more likely to be digitally excluded. We know that there's been a disproportionate amount of deaths of people with learning disability um, acro across the world. And um, you know, we also know that we still live in a world where we've got many, many care homes and um, people are locked away in those care homes and have had um, not been able to see their relatives and um, have, have had their human rights to connections with the outside world deeply affected. So um, we've been looking at the history of people with learning disabilities and thinking about where we are now. And um, we've invited today, Simon Jarrett, who's going to be our main speaker for the next hour, who's written an amazing book, which he's gonna tell you all about in a minute. And um, we're gonna be looking at, at, at some of the issues relating to people with learning disability in, in today's society. So um, before we go any further, what I'd like to do is just show you a little bit of an example of what we've been discussing this morning. So we use Jamboard a lot in our in our groups um, in order to collect information and it's a really great interactive way um, for people with learning disabilities to um, engage with us in our groups. So we asked, um, we had an open session this morning in our Sheffield Voices group and we asked everybody um, that came along what they like to do and what their lives look like and people were talking about having relationships people were talking about having the, a family life people were talking about having pets and going on holiday getting drunk staying out late and generally living life the way they wanted to most people don't have risk assessments they didn't have to ask anybody if they could stay out late um, they didn't have, have to have anybody accompanying them that wanted to go home early if they went to a nightclub. And all these things, um, you know, do affect people with learning disabilities. So we asked then our group if they could tell us a little bit about what their lives look like. And this is what they said, that people often have to go home early because their handovers are at eight o'clock, that people want the right to have equal opportunities, that they feel shut out of employment still people feel shut out of safe housing and um, they don't feel that they have a private life um, they're far more likely to have social services involved if they have um, children um, they aren't allowed to take the risks that other people take and and they don't feel like they're being treated the same so we talked about you know what human rights is and what what they have a right to so um, we just wanted to quickly show you that to have a, so that you can have a glimpse of what we do in our learning disability group. So I'm going to welcome our guest, Simon Jarrett. Hello, Simon. Hello. Hello, everybody. And um, thank you very much for um, inviting me today. It's great to be here. And it looks like you've got a great group going. 
Thank you, Simon. So, Simon, I've accidentally left my copy of your book downstairs. Do you happen to have a copy with you so you can show everybody? Well, I just happened to, actually. Fantastic. I'm so thrilled about that. So, Simon, you wrote this amazing book that I've been reading all week. So when was your book published, Simon? Uh, just published about two or three weeks ago. So you're one of my first readers. Yay, fantastic. And what an amazing book it is, I have to say. So today I'm going to start by asking you some questions about your book. Um, what, what would be really great is we've got a massive audience actually that have joined us today, which I'm thrilled about, is if people want to ask some questions, if you want to, guys, if you just want to type your questions into the chat box, and then we'll have sort of 20 minutes, 30 minutes afterwards, a question and answer session from the audience with you, Simon, if that's okay. Absolutely fine. I'd be happy to take any questions. Fantastic. So, Simon, I'm going to start with asking you as to why you chose this title. So, it's a, whenever I've shown people this book, they've gone, oh, you've used the word idiot on the title, on the cover yeah. of this book. And they're a bit shocked about yeah. this. So. Yeah. I, I just want to know what what made you choose this title. OK, well, it, it's it's a very good question. And the, the first thing I want to say is that obviously the term idiot now is a, an insult. We use it's used to insult people. Um, and there's no intention at all in my title to do that. Of course not. You know, this, this book is really all about the rights of people with learning disabilities and, and what their rights should be. But Idiot was the term that was used in history in the past um, to describe people pretty much in the way that we would describe people who have learning disabilities today. And since then, that name has changed really rapidly and ever more quickly over the years. And we've had all sorts of different words that have been used since idiot we've had. And I'm sorry, it's a long list of names that don't sound very nice. But this this is the history, you know, um, we've had mental defectives, we've had um, mental handicap, we've had imbeciles, morons, cretins, all these terrible words. And then we had um, uh, after mental handicap, we had learning disability and people now talk about intellectual disability and one of the things I look at in the book is why this language changes so much and so often and it always goes back to this root of the time when people were called idiots but that word became an insult so the language changed again and that keeps happening you know people use whatever term is is around to insult people with and then it changes so I thought let's be really honest about this and what's happened and that's why I put it on the cover and the book is actually called those they called idiots because the book is about people from that time who were known as idiots in 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 those days and so I thought it was important to really have it out there uh, on the front but there is another reason so I make I make no apology for this but I really wanted the book to be noticed and to have an impact and I didn't want it just to be read by um, the usual small group of people who are interested in this subject or university lecturers and professors. I wanted it to be read by the public. And I talked with the publishers about this um, and we needed a really striking cover with a good picture and a good title because I want to get the message out much further so that people who don't usually take an interest in people with learning disabilities and their rights um, to become interested in it. And so a couple of things have happened, like, for example, the book was mentioned in one of the daily papers on Monday, uh, one of the big national newspapers, because they were talking about the television series, The Crown. And there's an episode in that where we find that there were two cousins of the Queen who had learning disabilities, who were discovered 30 or 40 years ago, living in what was known then as a mental handicap hospital, one of these long stay hospitals called, uh, called Earlswood near London. And in the newspaper, they wrote about my book because I wrote, I write about Earlswood as well. 
So it meant that lots of people who were just reading about the crown because they're interested in the television series started to be able to read about this and, and, and what I've said in the book. So, so that's sorry, that was a long answer, but that's where the title comes from. It was a great answer, Simon. So thank you for that. So Simon, what made you write this book? Right. Well, um, I've, I've been writing this book for, for seven years. It's been um, a, a big project. And before I started writing the book, um, I spent a lot of my time working with people with learning disabilities, alongside people with learning disabilities, supporting people with learning disabilities. And my interest in the history started again many this was in the 1980s so probably before quite a few of you here were even born but i was um working as a nursing assistant in what was known as a mental handicap hospital it was one of these old old hospitals that lots of people with learning disabilities used to live in um and um i was just young at the time and i was working with that I, I write about this in the book and on my first day when I was working there, there was an old man, I'll call him G to protect his identity. And he had been, he was in his seventies, he was over 70 years old and he'd been working in this hospital. He'd been living, sorry, as a patient in this hospital since he was six years old. So he'd spent his whole life living in this hospital. And I started to read his notes and I read his, notes from when he was admitted to the hospital as a six-year-old child and this was back in the 1920s just just after world war one very long time ago and again i'm going to use some shocking language the opening line of his notes said george is a bat-eared cretin right now the word cretin is an insult so it used, used to be around a lot and I thought, why are they writing about this poor boy, this six-year-old boy like this? And what I discovered when I started to look into it was that was the correct term to use at the time, if you like. It was what the medical profession used. And I was very shocked by this. And it made me want to discover the history. Why had this man spent his whole life since his childhood locked away in a hospital um, completely separated from society, not seen as somebody that could live in mainstream society with everybody else. And why, why had this happened? And um, that was really why I started the research, or at least the idea about starting this research started in my head um, many years ago. Thank you for that. So Simon, in, your, in the very first chapter of your book, um, you talk about um, the 18th century and the emergence of psychiatry and yeah. how um, how psychiatry led to asylums being open in the mid mid 18th century. And then you sort of talk about um, before the 18th century and people with learning disabilities actually being included in society a lot more and that there are so many lessons that we can learn from that. Yes. Yeah. So um, I just want to just stay on the point about um the 18th century and what what do you think those lessons that we yeah. can learn are and could you also give some examples of what you mean um as well simon yes I'd, i i i will do so this this is um, a a really interesting question so when i started to look at the history a lot of it was about this time when people lived in these long stay hospitals they're sometimes known as asylums they were called asylums at the time and a lot of this happened in the in the 19th century and society suddenly started locking everybody up in these asylums making them leave the rest of society and and go and live um behind these high walls locked away as patients in hospitals and it wasn't just people with learning disabilities it was also people with mental health problems people some people with physical disabilities deaf people and i asked myself the question well okay that happened in the 19th century what happened to people before then where were they living before these hospitals were built 
And so I started to do my research about the 18th century, as Catherine has um, said. And what I discovered was that in, in that period, and we're talking about a long time ago now, we're talking about a good 300 years ago, um, people lived in their communities, people who had learning disabilities, who were called idiots at the time, they lived in their communities, they were part of families, they often had jobs, they were loved and accepted by their families and their neighbours and, and their, their workplaces, and they were very much part of their communities, right? So there's, there's a bit of a myth, there's a, a myth that's around, a, a, a made up story, which says that before the asylums took people in, people were treated very badly and they used to be locked up in cellars or they'd have stones thrown at them or this and that. And actually that didn't happen. That is a story that was made up by doctors who were trying to um, give a good reason why people should come into their hospitals. And they say, oh, they can't manage. You hear these words today, they can't manage out in the community. So we're going to take them and look after them because they need looking after. They, they can't look after themselves. Now, what I found was that this wasn't true at all. And I looked at lots of different um, uh, things, at different sources to help me try and understand what was happening. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. You asked me for an example, Catherine. So I'm going to talk about some um, uh, criminal cases that happened in the 18th century in the uh, Old Bailey, which was the, the big criminal court in London and which is still there. Um, and I found quite a number you, that there were records of all these cases and what was said and people would be up in the court for quite small offences like pickpocketing, shoplifting, stealing a, uh, stuff off a building site or, or things like that. The trouble was the law in those days was very harsh. And for doing something like that, you could even be hung. You could be executed, right, if you did something. So people would appear in court and very often they were on trial for their lives. Now, I found a number of cases and it was people with learning disabilities. They talk about them as idiots in, in the descriptions of these trials. And they're up before the judge and the jury on these offences. And what's really interesting about it is you hear their friends and relatives and their workmates come into their courtroom as witnesses to talk about them. And what you hear time and time and time again is people defending them, supporting them, putting themselves on the line to save their lives, right? So we've got a, uh, there's a case of a, a young woman, she has learning disabilities and she has epilepsy and she's on trial for stealing some ribbons from a shop, right? But she could be hung for this. And her father stands up in front of the court and he says, I know she was silly. I know she shouldn't have done this. And he uses the language of the time. He says, she's a weak, easy girl. Now that was a way people talked about somebody with a learning disability. And he said, she's a, a weak, easy girl, but I love her. He said, I love her and she's all I've got. So please let her go and I'll protect her and the family will protect her and we'll make sure that she doesn't do anything like this again. And the really fascinating thing then is that the judge and the jury say, okay, let her go. Yeah, let her go. They do protect her and um, she's not treated harshly and she goes back into her community. And as I said, this happened so many times in all the trials that I looked at. So there was one guy and his name was Thomas Baggett, right? And he was in a big riot in the middle of London. And he was in court accused of rioting. And that was a very serious offence and you would most definitely be hung for it if you were found guilty. And in this trial, about 15 people come in as witnesses for him, and they describe him as half an idiot. Oh, he's a bit like an idiot, you know, and he, he can't understand this, and he doesn't understand money, and he can't do that. But he works for us, and he's fine, and he does a good job, and um, we like having him around. 
Now, what happens is his mum comes in, his sister comes in, uh, his boss from his workplace comes in, and um, his workmates and neighbours. And they all say, oh, he didn't do it. He, di he wasn't involved in this rioting because he was with me. Now, the thing is, most of them are lying because they were all in different places. He couldn't have been with all of them. But in order to save him, they were all lying on his behalf. And again, he was found not guilty. He was acquitted, even though really everybody knew he had been involved in all this fighting and, and, and rioting. So I found this stuff really interesting. And I just got this impression of people being very much part of their communities, accepted by the communities, protected by the communities. It wasn't all lovely. You know, sometimes you saw people being abused and badly treated, but people would always step in to try to protect them um, and, and to support them. Um, Brilliant. And that really fascinated me. And I think it's got a lot of lessons for us Thank about you. how we live today. Simon, that's really interesting. And and I, I just I kind of want to move on now to the 19th century and just ask you, you know, what changed? What changed in the 19th mm. century for people with learning disabilities? Yeah. Well, I, I, I try to work out what what happened because we went from this situation where everybody did live in their communities and with their neighbours and friends and families. And uh, we get to a situation where suddenly everybody is being put into asylums. They're being locked, locked away. So I tried to ask the question, what changed? And I think a few things changed. And one of them is that in the 18th century, communities were very small. OK, e even in a big city like London or Sheffield or, or somewhere like that, inside the community of the whole city, you had lots of small communities. And these communities looked after their own, if you like, you know, they, they, they looked after everybody who was part of it. And you didn't have social services, you didn't have day centres, you didn't have um, uh, district nurses coming around to people's houses. There was no support because there the just wasn't that sort of government around in those days. So communities had to look after each other because there was no one else to do it. And that changed in the 19th century. You started to get a lot more government, if you like, and a lot more of authorities taking control about people. And there was also a change in the way people thought about things. They, they stopped being comfortable about people who were different. They wanted everybody to be the same and you had to conform you know you had to go along with what everybody expected and if you didn't do that then you were seen as not belonging to society anymore and you, you there were certain things you were expected to do if you wanted to be a citizen you know and so if you couldn't do that or you struggled with it or you wanted to do it differently you started to become seen as an outsider so I think these were two of the big things that that changed and society started saying there's a certain type of person we want everybody to be if you're not that sort of person if you've got a learning disability if you're a criminal if you've got a mental health problem if you've got a physical disability we don't want you around anymore so it was a very big change and at the beginning of of the 19th century several hundred people lived in institutions. By the end of the 19th century, uh, nearly 200,000 people lived in institutions. So there was a, a massive change. That's incredible. Simon, so then that takes us to the 20th century. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about what happens in the 20th century then? And start okay. trying to bring us up to date a little bit. Okay, well, um, uh, I wish I could tell you it was all fantastic, um, but it wasn't, but it does, it gets better. Um, so at, at, at the beginning of the 20th century, which was the last century, I mean, a lot of us, uh, you know, if you're over 20 years old, you, you lived in the, in the 20th century. And at the beginning of that century, things got very bad indeed. 
for people with learning disabilities. Um, because there was this idea that we should try to make, um, I suppose you'd call it perfect people, right? And so um, they tried even harder than they had in the previous century to move everybody out of society if they didn't, um, if they didn't fit in. Um, and so you had something that was called the Mental Deficiency Act, which was an act of parliament in 1913. And um, the idea was that if you had a learning disability, which was called mental deficiency at the time, you had to go and live in what they called a colony, a mental deficiency colony. And these were out in the countryside. They were like the long stay hospitals. But the idea was you went in there as a baby and you stayed there for the rest of your life until you, uh, and, until you died. So that's the sort of place that I was working in when I told you about that person called G, uh, G who, I, who I met, who'd been, who was over 70 years old and had lived there since he was six years old. So <clears throat> for a long time during the 20th century, probably about half, 50% of people with learning disabilities were sent off to live in these colonies that they were called. They were in England, but they were called colonies. And the other half, people who still lived with their families were supervised very closely. They had visitors coming to the house. They didn't want them to have children. They didn't want them to lead an ordinary life. You know, So a visitor would come to the house, a mental welfare visitor every week and check that you were behaving yourself, that you weren't doing anything, blah, blah. And um, so it went on. And um, really people lived in these institutions until very near the end of the 20th century. And then in the 1980s and the 1990s, it did change. And um, we, we, we call this sometimes the great return. Everybody started to return to the communities that they were born in rather than living in the hospitals. And we call it care in the community as well. And much more what we recognize today, you know, what we live in today, uh, most of the big institutions closed down and most people moved back into their communities or when they were born, they weren't sent off to hospitals. They, um, they uh, were able to live at home or in their own place. Um, so this was a really big improvement. And I talk about this in the book and it was a fantastic thing. But as we all know today, and I've looked at the um, uh, the charts you were doing this morning in the uh, in, in the session that you had talking about your rights and, and your lives, there are still many, many problems. And we still have people living in what are called assessment and treatment units where they get treated very badly, which are like the old institutions. And we have lots of people being very restricted in what they can or can't do for various reasons. So what I say in the book is things got much, much better, definitely at the end of the 20th century. Um, but if we think we've solved everything and made everything OK, uh, we haven't. You know, there are, there, are, there are still many problems. I don't need to tell you because you experience them every day in your lives. So Simon, you know, I call this the disability hokey cokey, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, go on. Yeah, this is really good. well, <laughs> you know, where where people with learning dis well, people with all disabilities, but particular people with learning disabilities have, you know, been sort of um, pulled either, you know, into society when it suits society to be involved. You know, that a good example of that is during the war when you know everybody went off to work and people with learning disabilities were brought in to be the main workforce in this country. And then everybody came back and then they were kicked out of the workforce again. And then we had the Remploy and, you know, people were given these jobs, you know, that were considered to be inclusive. But actually they were in factories across the country that were in the middle of nowhere often. And these people weren't supported or even spoken to about would they like to do anything different with their lives? You know, um, so I, I, I guess the disability hokey is about you know, bringing people in at the whim of social policy. 
Oh, it, it, it's it's such a good image. I mean, you said that to me yesterday, and I, I hadn't heard it before, but it's really good. And it really is, you know, in out in out, um, depending on whatever's going on in society at the time. So one of the things I talk about a bit in my book, an example I give is World War One, right at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was when the Mental Deficiency Act came in. The Mental Deficiency Act came in the year before World War One broke out. Now, what everybody was saying, they used horrible language about people. They talked about people in the most terrible way. And they said, they're no good. These mental defectives, they're no good. They can't work. They can't do anything. You know, they just eat. They, they, they don't contribute anything themselves. And we don't want them. You know, they can, they can go off into hospitals. Now, what happened when World War I broke out, all the men were sent off to fight on the front, millions of them. They were sent off to fight in the war. Now, we all know that one of the things that happened then was that women who'd been told they couldn't work and they shouldn't do this and they should stay at home and bring up the families all went and worked in the factories because they had to, because they replaced the men. So all of a sudden we found that women, of course, could work and they could do all these jobs that, that men do. But the thing we don't know so much about is that also people with learning disabilities went and worked. They worked in the factories and they did all these jobs. So we went in one year from being told they can't work, they can't do anything, to people actually being put into highly skilled jobs in um, factories. And I came across a letter that was uh, written at the uh, towards the end of the war and it was a letter to the government and it said now we've got a problem because soon all the men are going to be coming back from the front and we've got all these mental defectives as he called it people with learning disabilities working in factories some of them in very highly skilled jobs what are we gonna do what do we do because the men when they come back from the war will want their their jobs back and we know what they did. Everybody went back into the hospitals and they went back to being told that they couldn't work. So that's a, you know, a fantastic example of your hokey cokey, Catherine. They were out, World War One. they came in and suddenly we found, oh, they can do all these things we said they can't do. And then we said, no, they can't anymore. And they were, they were out again. Yeah, absolutely. So Simon, just moving on then, how do you think we're doing now? How do I think we're doing now? Um, if you'd asked me this question 10 or 15 years ago, I'd have said, I think we're doing much, much better. Um, we had a thing called valuing people, which a lot of you might know about, which was a, a, you know, which really tried to put people with learning disabilities in, in control of their own lives. Um, we had people like Simon Duffy, who I'm sure you all know, I don't know if he's in the audience today or not, but you had Simon doing incredible work around people taking control of their own lives, managing their own budgets, employing their own staff, everything like that. And it really felt as if people with learning disabilities were getting their place back in society, that there were people were being given opportunities to work if they wanted to, um, to work um, and, and so on. I have to say, in the last few years, I've become a lot more pessimistic, and I feel in some ways we're, we're, we're going backwards, that um, we have these assessments and treatment units where terrible things have been happening. Some of you have probably seen the documentaries on Panorama or elsewhere of people getting very, very badly treated, being locked away for no reason for years, um, being deprived of all their freedom, all their human rights. We're going back to, in some ways, to a time when people were seen as being needing to live in, in, in big institutions. Now, I don't want to depress everybody. Loads of really brilliant things are still happening. And people are much more in control of their, their own lives and much more part of society um, than they used to be. But I think at the moment, we have to be very careful to try and stop this drift um, backwards to uh, more towards where we used to be. There are fantastic things. I'm seeing people with Down syndrome 
acting in television plays and things which I never used to see in the past. We're, we're seeing really high achieving people, you know, doing all sorts of amazing things. There's a fantastic book that Saba Salman has just written in which people tell their stories about what they've done with their lives, you know, um, and lots of just ordinary people with learning disabilities doing incredibly well leading their everyday lives. So there's lots of good things, but I am a bit worried at the moment about how things are going. So, so Simon, in your book, um, you talk about the gift model. Now, I was introduced by the gift model through Simon Duffy's work um, yes. more recently. Um, and you talk about this set of, it's almost like a prescription that, um, you know, services give a framework of how people with learning disabilities should live their lives in the community. Yeah. But just, just before you go on to talk a little bit about that, because I know we're running out of time. Um, I know we had a, um, a discussion yesterday. I was telling you about a conversation I had with one of the commissioners in Sheffield. Mm -hmm. And she told me that this um, day service was, rang her up and said, we've got this amazing sensory room. And it, um, it is this fantastic state of the art um, projector. <clears throat> excuse me, that projects the um, leaves, autumn leaves falling, you know, into this room so people can go in there and really feel like they're in, in the countryside. And it begs the question of why don't care workers just take people out into the countryside? Why do we need a sensory room projecting an image of yeah. a country onto a wall? You yeah. know, and, and it is still, there is still these narrow, defined remakes that we, the people with disabilities seem to have to live within, isn't there? I, I, I think that story sums it up really well, because, because what happens is, is people make another community outside the community that people have to operate in. So like you say, instead of going off into the forest or the, the woods or wherever to look at some leaves, you sit in a room and look at some pictures of leaves on a, on a wall. And, um, you know, and that's a, a different life. It's outside the community. And we talk about this gift idea that really people are being told that to be in the community is a gift that they're being allowed. And I'm always interested in the language that people use. And you often hear people talking about accessing the community right? Well, I don't access the community, I'm in the community. And I think if you're saying that someone has to access the community, you mean they're outside it, and then they're allowed in it for a bit, and then they go outside it again. So, and this is where, going back to where we started, I think the 18th century has a lot of lessons for us, funnily enough, although it was a long time ago, because those societies adapted themselves, those communities adapted themselves to the people that were in them. Our communities today are too rigid, too firm. And we say, if you're like this, you can come into our community. But if you don't behave like this, or you're, you're different, and you do different things to what we all do, you can stay outside our community. And that, I think, is the problem we have to address. Simon, it's been amazing talking to you. We've got 20 minutes left. We've got loads of questions in the chat box. Um, so I just kind of wondered if we could just have a, I'm just scrolling back up here madly. Um, just comments, questions. So um, some people talking about valuing people. Um, I think Paul, so some of our group members that are on might struggle to actually write in the chat box. So I think it might be a good place to start just by asking people if they've got any questions. Sure. So Paul, I know Paul's got a hearing. Paul, can, yeah. you hear, can you hear me okay? Can you? Great. So you were holding something up. Did you want to oh. say something, Paul? I did, yeah. Um, it was about how we find a, a, a lot of people at, 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 at the moment. Um, doctors, back then, Use use to use shock treatment for people with, with mental health needs. Now, thank goodness that's gone. Let's hope now we go into the future and see where 
people are now being treated more, more sensibly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it's a very good point you make. And um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not very kind about doctors and the medical profession in my book, mm. because I think they've done a lot of harm it, over It's the years. because I have been there by myself. A right. bit of a personal story, really, because when I was born with, with Down syndrome, yeah. my, parents, my parents were told, that I won't walk, I won't talk, I will be a flaming cabbage. And that's what the doctor said to my parents. And wow. thank goodness that got me out of that hospital. Wow. Thank you for that, Paul. Well, you're one of the people, sorry, Simon, you're, you, you're very involved in drama, aren't you? You're one of the people um, yeah. that Simon's talking about in terms of having these amazing aspirations. Like you, you know, you're brilliant at drama. And you're going to be I just to say, because um, uh, Paul's one of my volunteers that helps me with the social night and he's brilliant with that as well. He's been ever so helpful, haven't you, Paul? Uh, I mean, that, that's great to hear. And, and look at you now, Paul, and, and look at what that doctor said about you, you know. And I have to mm. say, that sort of thing just makes me yeah. really angry. It we need to really give angry. doctors a more awareness training on how to deal with people with Down syndrome. Yeah, yeah. And it's like uh, with the Emmerdale story. Well, I can't exactly. believe they've done that. Yeah. The, the Emmerdale story is a really big issue. I expect you've all heard about it where there's a, uh, a, a a, a plot, a story in Emmerdale, uh, the Emmerdale soap opera coming up where a couple have got a Down syndrome um, baby about to be born and they're deciding whether to have an abortion or not, you know, and people are just saying, why are you showing a plot like this in a, in a soap opera when even, even Emmerdale has a character with with Down syndrome in it is a much loved loved character. You know, you, you you wouldn't do this about anybody else. So, why are you doing it? Yeah, quite shocking. Thank you, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Simon. Okay. Um. So Simon Duffy, who we've got coming up next. Oh, he is um, here. So he's saying, um, wasn't some of this change in the nineteenth century about social control and threatening people who were poor? Uh, yes, it was very much about that. Um, it was, um, you, you saw a very big change happen in the 19th century where um, government started to control uh, a lot more than it had ever been able to in the past. And they were very threatened by anybody who was different or anybody who didn't conform. And so you, um, and really all these, it, it wasn't just institutions for people with learning disabilities, it was prisons, it was workhouses that the poor were put into, uh, it was special uh, units for single mothers who'd had babies out of marriage and so on. So there was really this big process of locking up, locking people up if they didn't confirm to the rules. Previously to that, it, it had been. Thank you, Simon. So, Annie, and I think it's. Sorry. Sorry, Simon, I thought you'd finished then. We've got a bit of an unstable internet connection. Oh, that's okay. I, I warned um, you yesterday I talked too much, so you better stop me. <laughs> so, we've got uh, Annie from, I think it's Annie Ferguson from um, Speak, our amazing friends in Rotherham at Speak Up, saying, an ordinary life of value and people made a difference but not enough. Still some horrible things happened that we need to speak about whenever we can. Ab absolutely. And, you know, these were great initiatives that started in the 1980s and the, and the 1990s. Um, and it's interesting you talk about ordinary life because there was this whole uh, bit of government policy, if you like, about people being able to lead an ordinary life. And if you think about it, it's terrible. We had to have a government policy which said that people could live an ordinary life. Why couldn't they just live 
an ordinary life anyway but it was because of all this stuff that had happened in the past so you're absolutely right we've had some great advances but what is brilliant is that people have got their voices people have always had their voices but their voices are being heard now more than they ever have with groups like yours and people have got to speak up they've got to speak up because um that will be an enormous help in stopping things going back to how they used to be so richard allen is saying that they um five years ago they signed him off not being capable of working even though he'd done a lot of voluntary work for many years this is a story we hear all the time simon yeah and uh, again we hear it time and time again and and look this goes back to what i was talking about about how in world war one all these people who've been told they couldn't work were, were suddenly found out you know that that, that they could work so the the the, the problem the fundamental problem is that a lot of doctors and a lot of people that work for the departments of work and pensions or wherever will look at a person with a learning disability and they'll look at all the things that they can't do or that they think they can't do they don't start with meeting a person and talking about what they can do so they write people off right at the beginning and they say well you can't do this you can't do that sit on benefits for the rest of your life you know or sit in a care home for the rest of your life or or whatever and and that's the attitude we have to change and again going back to what i said earlier that's why i wanted this book to reach beyond the circles it, it, it it's usually in because i want to challenge that sort of thinking so richard also goes on to say a little bit late um further down in the chat that he doesn't feel the equality act is worth the paper it's written on under the tory government either you know would, is that something you'd agree with simon yeah i mean i, I think this is something um Simon Duff is um, uh, very good on. Um, but yeah, I, I'm doing some work about human rights and uh, equality rights and so on at the moment. The problem is, if they're simply a group of rights that are written down on a piece of paper, they're very little use to anybody, right? Um, because unless they can be enforced, and unless society accepts that people have those rights, then um, they won't happen. All those people that are in assessment and treatment units and being treated badly, they're all protected by the Human Rights Act. They're all protected by the Equalities Act. But it's not doing them any good. If you go into somewhere where your rights aren't respected, you know, so it, it, it's all about you, you need the rights. You must have the rights. But there also has to be a way of thinking, culture, attitudes, where people accept those rights and make sure that, that, that people are able to use them in their lives. OK, so um, I know, Simon, you're, there's a, a, definitely a few more questions. Um, Simon's saying that we're trying to develop a neighbourhood approach in Sheffield now. It would be great if this was something good people could get involved in. Um, you know, Simon will give you the stage in five minutes. You've got a whole um, hour to tell us all about that. Can I just say quickly there, neighbourhood was the word that was used in the 18th century. They didn't talk about community. They talked about neighbourhood. Right. And they said, oh, he's from the neighbourhood. Everybody knows him. Yeah. So um, I think Charlotte, we're going to take one last question from Charlotte, then we're going to, um, you're going to tell everybody where we can buy your book, um, Simon, if that's okay. And then we we'll just have a few minutes break before Simon comes on, if that's okay, because we're doing two sessions back to back here. So Charlotte, can you take yourself off mute? I've I took myself off mute. Okay. Would you like to uh, it, it wasn't a question as such. I was uh, wanting to say about Simon, uh, how he was uh, saying about people not getting the um, opportunity with jobs and saying that they should be just um, stay on benefits and such. That's why, like, like said myself, that's why I've got my own business because I'm obviously I've struggled to get jobs in salons and. Um, etc like that's why Annie's been helping me with my salon because obviously I've wanted to be like 
what everyone else is like and have the opportunity to work and obviously it's like it's been so hard in this lockdown and it's like why shouldn't people have the chance of working and stuff like that even if they have to adjust things well you've said it better than i can can, can say it. what is it a hairdressing salon no it's a beauty salon beauty salon well good for you you know and i i really admire the way people find ways to overcome all these obstacles that are thrown in their in their way and you've mm. obviously worked incredibly hard to do that and set that up for yourself and um good for you i i, I really admire you for having done that and I, mm. I wish it hadn't had to be such a struggle for you because obviously you have the talent you know and you can yeah. do it but anyway you've you've found a way to get your talent yeah. out so Thank you. So, um, Kate Brackley, um, hi Kate from Build. Um, Kate saying that she's been speaking up for many years since the day of valuing people started back in 2001. It should be focusing on the social model of how somebody with a learning disability can do and not the medical model of disability. Yeah. It's not about the disability, it's about the person who has a learning disability has, has an ordinary life and they are supported so we continue to lead life worth living. I think that's a wonderful point to, to round, draw close to today with you, Simon. Yeah, brilliant, um, brilliant point, yeah. Simon, it's just been absolutely amazing you coming on and, and chatting to us today. We have recorded this, we're gonna put it out on YouTube because we really wanna share this with other people. You know, people who look after people with learning disabilities, um, you know, often don't understand the history of people. You made this point in your book, you know, and people have had sometimes horrendous histories and people come in at all different points as personal assistants and support workers and carers. And they've not really got that full grasp of what people's lives look like and, and what they should be achieving. And I think the work you're doing is really fantastic to try and, you know, bring awareness to the fact that people have got a history with people with learning disabilities being abused throughout history. The hist hit disability hokey coke has been taking place since the 18th century. And, you know, people need to live, you know, the way that they want to live. So thank you. Where can people buy your book, Simon? Right, well, um... That I'm just noticing that Paul's holding something up, I think, uh, trying to get your attention, maybe. Right. Oh, sorry, I can't see Paul. So... Oh, oh, I've got a book here. I've done it about my life. You can get the book. It's, it's, it's done with one Dan Goodley, another disability studies reader. Well, Dan Goodley's a great friend of ours from Sheffield University. You can get it here. Okay, so my, my chapter is chapter 10. And it's You've got a chapter my, in it. My life, my work, and everything. That's amazing, Paul. Well done. So um, I think we'll yeah. just have a five minute break before Simon Duffy comes on and speaks, if that's okay. Um, Simon, did you want to say anything before we close? No, just say the book. I'm, I'm sorry, the book, book can't be really cheap because the publishers have to you know, get the money. So the full price is £25. There is a, a discount that you can get it for £20, but also it's on things like Amazon and Hive and things like that. You'll probably get it at a, at a cheaper price um, there. But um, uh, have a look first, see if it's for you. Not, not everybody loves history books, uh, especially not mine. But um, uh, if you do want to get it, that's probably the best way to get it. Great. Thank you so much, Simon, and ho hopefully you're going to stick around. I don't know if you're sticking around for Simon Duffy. I, I am going to try and stay for a bit. And okay. can I just thank everybody that's come along and listened today and just absolutely superb questions. Were, I mean, really good. You really had me on my toes there, so I hope <laughs> I answered them okay, but really good questions. You were brilliant. Thank you, Simon. You take care now.